Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well. Recently I made a series of criticisms to several things that have been said pertaining to gender and the transgender movement as a whole. And one in particular involved Peter Boghossian's uh, interview with Richard Dawkins about Aristotelian metaphysics. This led to Peter having Colin Wright, biologist, come on his show to critique what me and Forrest, biologist, had to say in response to Richard Dawkins. And long story short, we decided to meet up in London to have a conversation to hopefully make some progress on a topic that so many people, by my lights, are just unable to have rational discourse about. So that's the plan. We'll see whether or not we can make it. Peter, thanks for, for, cool. for well, bringing me. Thanks for you guys for driving up, up here to London. So what I want to do is just facilitate a conversation between you two. And my, my goal in all this, there's no gotchas or anything. I'm like genuinely trying to understand. So I'll, uh, I'll repeat back to you and Colin, if I think my golden rule is I try to understand. And if I don't understand, then I'll ask a question about whatever it is to help me understand. So, so the, the, I, where, where I want to start before we get into any details or nitty gritty, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with the definition of words. Because yes. I have found overwhelmingly when there's a disagreement, something, people using words differently or they don't mean the same things by words. So that's where I'd like to start. And that's where philosophy starts, right? That's where you get to your bedrock. You need to make sure that you're working with the same premises. But I did have a question. There. Yeah, it yeah. It's like you want to sit as a third person in this conversation, whereas I want you in as a participant. You've made plenty of content pertaining to this. You're the philosopher. Yeah. Colin is the biologist. And I think that I want both angles. So please don't sit as a third person. Yeah, I do see it as a I do see it as third person because I see the conversation as a biological conversation. But let's see how it evolves. Well, actually, let's actually, actually the definition something that's 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 something importance and also of psychological and anthropological importance if not entirely biological otherwise we'd only be talking about sex and not gender okay well let's let's just define our right. words and see where we go all right so uh let's see the first word is so we got i think we have four words that are key here sure and feel free to add additional words as we go along mm -hmm. man woman male female. Yep. And Colin, please don't hesitate. I think those are the key terms about which the the potential misunderstanding or maybe it's actually not a misunderstanding. Those are the the, the key the key terms so I think it's of indispensable importance that we start here and see if we can agree yep. before we do anything else if we can agree upon these terms now yeah we, we if there's a point where we don't agree then we can just use them as placeholders temporarily until we refine it later on okay mm -hmm. so let's let's do that let's go with uh the definition of man you, you, Stephen, you want to do yours and then yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. so the way that i would see, i would define a man to be it's someone who lives up to a social construct that heavily correlates with phenotype aesthetics and behaviors that's the way I define a man. Okay, so someone who lives up to a social construct. We don't do that. Whatever you're doing, don't do that. Someone who lives up to a social construct that, that is typically associated. Write it down directly, verbatim. You've got a good job here, Reed. Yeah, that is typically associated with phenotype. With phenotype. A aesthetics and behaviors. Aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And behaviors. Okay, so I'm going to read that back to make sure that's accurate, okay? Mm -hmm. Someone who lives up to a social construct that is typically associated with phenotype, aesthetics, and behaviors. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Yeah, that's the oh. initial I think has the most utility. Oh, oh. okay. Well, oh, okay. Colin, oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey. What do you, is that how you use the word man? Is that the understanding you have of the definition of man? That's not how I use the term, but I understand that that is what I would call sort of the the generic definition uh, used in sort of the the gender framework. Um, and so that's that's something I'd be happy to 
to talk about why I disagree with that definition, um, why I think it might be regressive or something like that. Okay, so it instead of there's no disagreement yet. There's only understanding. What is your definition of man? Because we have Stevens. What is yours? Mine is very simple and one that Stephen probably anticipates. It's an a, uh, adult human male. Good. Yep. Okay. So Reed will write that down. Adult human male. Okay. Uh, it, I don't want to be pedantic, but I do want to go through the rest of these terms. No, I'm fine with being pedantic. I think one of the reasons why people get stuck on this and dismiss people with, you know, label and dismiss terms on both sides is because they're not doing this home. I 100% agree. Don't worry. Yeah. So take our time on it. It's very important. I 100% agree. Okay. So is it fair then to say that the definition of woman mm -hmm. is exactly what the definition of man is, yes. but with a woman? So I'm going to repeat that so that everybody's clear. Yes. Someone who lives up to a social construct that is typically associated with phenotype, aesthetics, and behavior. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Okay. So, and then <clears throat> Colin, I assume, and if this assumption makes an ass out of you and me, let me know that your definition of woman is analogous with just the substitution of female, adult human female. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So we now, un we now have what we mean by the terms woman and man. And then next one, <clears throat> so no disagreement yet. No, no, no. But there might be something that, of course, people might be confused about. And that is that my definition for a man is the same for a woman. We'll unpack this later, I'm certain, but just so that I can preempt it. The, the work is being done on the differences of the phenotype, aesthetics, and behaviors. But we will get to that when we come to the unpack. Okay, let's, let's, I just want to secure this so that everybody's on the same page when we have the conversation. Okay, mm -hmm. so the definition of male, uh, uh, Stephen, do you, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So one of the reasons why I insist that this is more of a philosophical and psychological and anthropological conversation is because I'm actually less concerned with, with the distinction of sex and gender and particularly with sex. It's gender I'm more interested in. Okay, so the my definition, definition, yeah. Yeah, my yeah. De definition of a male would be someone who typically has X, Y chromosomes, and if you want to, you can add to that um, someone who has, uh, would have uh, testicles and produce small gametes. Okay, so I'm gonna read this back to make sure that I understand. I'm sure it will be very similar to what um, what Colin has. So I'm, I'm happy to rephrase it once we see what he's got. Okay. So I'm just going to read this back. The definition of male, someone who typically has XY chromosomes and or testicle and an and, and, and. Uh, so no or not. Okay. Someone who typically has XY chromosomes and testicles and produces small gametes. Is that correct? Yes. I believe that is, is a refiner if we get down the line. Okay. Uh, yeah. We can always refine these later. It's fine. Um, so, uh, Colin, the definition of a male is what? So a male is someone or an organism whose primary reproductive anatomy is organized around or has the function to produce small gametes or sperm. Okay, so... Yeah, um, whose primary reproductive anatomy is organized around, the pro uh, organized around or has the function to produce small gametes. Can I ask what uh, your primary reproductive... Hold, hold on, hold on. Let me just, let me just, I want to repeat this back and make sure that we got this right. Someone whose primary reproductive anatomy, an anatomy, is organized around or has the function to produce small gametes. Is that correct? Is that what you said to us? Yeah. I would actually maybe substitute, uh, instead of anatomy, say uh, organs. Okay. Someone whose primary reproductive organs are, are organized around or has the function to produce small gametes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So before we ask anything or criticize anything, I just want to get yep. everything down. Best. Okay. So can you tell us the definition of female, Stephen? It's like Reed's doing it for us. Someone who typically has XX chromosomes, it would be um, ovaries and produces large gametes. Okay. So I'm going to read this back to make sure this is clear. Sure. Someone who typically has XX chromosomes, ovaries, and produces large gametes. Is that accurate? It is accurate, yep. Okay. So, Stephen, uh, can you please give us your definition? I'm sorry, dude. So, Colin, can you please give us your definition of 
female. Yeah. So uh, an organism whose primary reproductive organs are organized around or has the function to produce large gametes. So same as male, but swap in large instead of small. Okay. And he, on this, uh, um, what Reed is doing, he has eggs there. Do you want the word eggs in there or no? That's fine because eggs are the large gamete. So Okay, so let's go all the way up to the top again. Okay. So now what I want to do is no criticism of any idea. Sure. I just want to make sure that everybody understands how we're about to use these words. So Stephen's definition of man is, and again, thank you for allowing me to spend so much time on this. This is I would have insisted to do the same. Indispensable importance. It's philosophy. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So the definition of man is someone who lives up to a social construct that is typically associated with phenotype aesthetics and behaviors. That's Stevens. Colin is an adult human male. Okay. So uh, I'll go, I'll, I'll kick off to you first, Colin. Not do you agree or disagree, but do you understand what, do you understand that sentence? Yes. Uh, okay. Peter, can I ask you if you understand it? Huh? Can I understand what your view is? No, no, I just... I, because you, you have to understand I'm, man, that you yeah, can I'm, issue criticism at me as well. Yeah, you know, I would really look, like it if you can... Get so involved. I just want... I'm attempting to facilitate this conversation, and I'm looking only for clarity, and I'm not putting... A so you're not interested in having a conversation yeah, no. with someone you've voiced disagreement? No, I'm interested in facilitating this particular okay. conversation. I want to facilitate this. So, Stephen... Do you understand, not do you agree with, his definition of adult human male? Yeah. Okay, so we all understand that. Okay, so by extension, let's go down to woman. I assume it's the same. Do you each understand, not agree with, but understand the definition of the other? Yep. Colin? Yes. So let's go down to definition of male. I'm going to go to Stephen first because he's his thing on the top. Uh, do you understand the death call, not agree with, but understand Colin's definition? Yes. So let's go through it. Okay. okay. Someone whose primary reproductive organs, um, so I assume that means, let's put aside secondary, pri uh, secondary reproductive organs. I'm not sure what primary is doing here. Um, if you could clarify that for me, Colin, that would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. This is referring specifically to the gonads. Okay. So if... If you didn't have the word primary there, would that be a problem? Yes, because a, a secondary reproductive organ would be something like a penis or a scrotum or a labia. And then secondary sex characteristics are sort of the, you know, what you gain during puberty, what differentiates us further. So in this case, a penis wouldn't count as the organ. It would have to be the uh, testicles. Yes. Cool. That makes sense. So that that's clear to you. That part makes clear. He's okay. also specified that they are organized around or have the function. So what this preempts is that they don't need to function. So if someone's born and they have testicles, but they don't work, which is to say, say that they don't facilitate the, what the chromosomes have got them to do, it would still count as a male on Colin's view. That is correct. I, I don't think something needs to be actively functional. In order to have a function, sort of like a car can break down, but it's still... And I appreciate that nuance in the definition. So yes, it seems like I do understand that. Oh, oh, okay, so now I'm going to ask a question just so that I'm clear. Someone whose primary reproductive organs, testicles, are organized around or have or has the function to produce small gametes, and you're okay with the word sperm in there? Yep. Okay. All right. Next, let's go down to female. Okay. Definition of female. It might be worth seeing whether or not he agrees with my definition of male. I don't know if Oh, I'm that. sorry. Did I fuck that up? Screw that up. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. My bad. Okay, Stephen, mm -hmm. uh, you gave this definition that I'm going to read, and Colin, you tell me if, if, uh, if this is clear. And, and uh, So Stephen gave someone who typically has XY chromosomes testicles and produces small gametes do you have any questions about that no questions but uh i, I would my per personally i would exclude chromosomes as being a like a necessary component of being biologically male and uh 
also the the f idea that you need to be able actively producing small gametes, uh, which I, I, I don't know if that's entailed in your definition or not, but. Well, we might be able to get rid of that. So maybe you can help me with this. Um, no better to ask a biologist, right? It seems to me that the reproductive organs that you're talking about, they are actually predicated on the chromosomes. The chromosomes are the things that tell it to be produced that way. So they're in some set, a subset of the set of chromosomes. So that is why I have chromosomes there. And, and also because it's a very high correlation, which is things we'll get into a little later. So if you have in, say, your definition and my definition, testicles and the, the ability to produce small gametes, uh, if these two things are essentially predicated on chromosomes, wouldn't it be fair to add chromosomes to that list? Or why is it that you wouldn't? So I wouldn't add chromosomes, well, first and foremost, because uh, if you want to just like stand back and survey the whole animal kingdom, uh, ant plant, or, uh, the whole uh, animal and plant kingdoms, any, any species that has males and females, not all of them have sex chromosomes. They don't determine sex with genes on chromosomes. And then secondarily, uh, you know, the, it's not necessarily the chromosomes themselves that are causing an organism to develop or a human to develop into a male and female. It's specific genes on regions of chromosomes. And there are instances, for instance, where like the SRY gene, which is the gene that makes males develop into males or that causes male development, can be like transposed onto an X. So you can have like XX males. Um, in, in some rare instances. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page about what these things are. So, Stephen, how do you define chromosomes? And then a call, and I'm going to ask you if you accept that definition. As I said, sex is not the main field that I'm interested in. So I, I, I understood, or how I understand it, is sex chromosomes, well, their role and what they do is they produce the testicles that you need to these... Uh, uh, this apparatus that both Colin and I use in our definitions. As for like the specifics of what they are, I don't know. Okay. Do, do you accept that, Colin? Um, well, I don't think he gave a definition. I don't, I don't know if they're just these entities where like DNA is wrapped around them and it helps organize uh, the genome essentially. So, well, I mean, I asked because it's in the definition of male. And so we would need to know what the words are that we're using to define males. Yeah. A, a chromosome is just like a vector a thing that carries genes, but genes can be swapped around from chromosomes. There's nothing inherently about the chromosome itself. Um, it's really the genes that are on the chromosomes. Uh, and those genes can be in different places and they would still be expressed. Okay. Okay. So Reed, where were we here? Where were we? Definition of female and what were we doing? Were we asking? Uh, I agree with others, Tam. Oh yeah. Any questions about? Yeah, so not you agree, but you understand, and do you have any questions about wanting to, you know, further define a term, or not you agree, but you understand? Uh, so the definition of female, Stevens is someone who typically has XX chromosomes, ovaries, and produces large gametes. So Colin, uh, do you have any questions for Steven about that, or do, do, do you think that you understand that? Not agree, but just understand. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I uh, understand it. Okay. Okay, Collins was someone whose primary reproductive organs are organized around or have the function to produce large gametes, and in the word in parentheses is eggs. So, Stephen, um, you know, I have a clarifying question about sure, of course, of course. Um, what you specified about chromosomes not being across the board for males and females, fantastic point, absolutely the case. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Um, when it comes to humans, is it what role do the chromosomes play in producing these organs? Um, are they always something that produce these produce these organs, or are they not? Yeah, it's it's an extremely tight correlation, but it's it's really specific genes that are on the chromosomes. So, like when like we we call we we say that males have X Y chromosomes because there's a gene on the Y chromosome called S R Y, and that's sort of what kicks development down the male pathway. Uh, and so the, it's not the chromosome itself that is causing the male to develop. It's the specific region uh, of genes on the chromosome. And that can be transposed, uh, doesn't necessarily reside always on a, a Y chromosome, even though it almost always does. Thank you. So would that mean, if I'm understanding correctly, that there are going to be some people that can produce large gametes, 
um, and yet it's not delivered through chromosomes at all? Or or is it that the chromosomes are always involved in this process for them to get to the ability to have that biological apparatus? Yeah, you're, you're always going to have chromosomes because all the genes are on the chromosomes, but it's not, you, you don't need to have sort of XY to create a male or XX to create a female. Uh, there are some females who are sort of XXY if the SRY is shut down on the, on the Y chromosome. So you can have females with a Y chromosome and you can have males that have no Y chromosome. Very rare, but it exists. Okay, so we, uh, go back up and scunch it in a little bit. Okay, yeah, okay. So we now have got the definition of a man, the definition of a woman, the definition of male, the definition of a female. We've secured definitions. We've secured understanding before we, and, and we've given everybody the opportunity to ask questions about the other definitions. So I think that's been a success. So now let's talk about points of, um, we can talk about points of disagreement and put points of agreement. So, sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah. I know you, you want to uh, direct it, and I, I think you're doing a great job. No, if, if uh, I make I do, it, I do, I do, I do want to um, yeah, yeah. ask uh, the question here. So one of the things that comes up in this conversation, especially with gender, again, I'm not so interested in sex, but I understand that your view has them very close, so we have to, using these definitions, bring them on board. Uh, one of the things that seems to be put across a lot is that there is the right answer to what gender is. Okay, but that's not... We're, we can do gender. We can put the yep. word, but we're not... There's no, no, nowhere in there that gender come up. No, no, no. If, I, if you now need to land the point, then right. if it's not relevant, fine, we're going across. What happens is people will say there is a right answer to this, and therefore there's no room for rational disagreement. So we're not talking about the utility of definitions. Rather, I'm right and you're deranged. That's what happens across the board with someone who has my view. And what I want to know, I'd like to know if you have that view as well, like, is there room for rational disagreement? But I understand that you don't want to participate in this. What? Well, and, and I want to know yours as well, Colin. I want to know, is there rational room for rational disagreement on this? Can two rational people say, I have a different view to you, but I see the utility in your view. And it's not wrong. It's just it's not the one that I prefer. Okay. So I'm, uh, the reason that I want to pause that is because I'm more than happy to go down that road. I just want to, I want to delineate. I want to keep this as narrow at the moment, and 100% we will go down the agenda. I just want to do just these words: S definitions, secure understanding. What is a possible point of agreement? What is a possible point of disagreement? I'm more than happy to jump into gender, like 100%. And I no, 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 want to no, make sure we're using these correctly. Isn't my point, however, pertaining to this? So we've done a great job of getting the definitions on the board. The next question is, is there room for rational disagreement or do you think that the other person is is objectively wrong? Like it, it, there is a right or wrong answer to the question. Oh, that's of important these? for moving forward. You mean yeah. a, a right or wrong answer? The, to the, the definitions that have been given here, for instance, yeah. I would say I can understand why someone might have the view of gender that Collins put across. Okay. And I can see that there's, rash, there's room for rational disagreement. I'm going to argue for why I think mine has greater utility, but I'm not going to say that Colin is deranged. And what I'm asking is whether or not that is extended to me from your side, or is it... The, no, At the moment, I'm not taking a side. Why. I'm just trying to... Yeah. But did you call it, did you want to comment? Yes. yes. I will say that I agree with Stephen. Uh, people can hold these two definitions. I'm happy to disagree on the utility or even the, the ethics, I think, of these definitions and things like that. Yeah. If we want to, if we if we want to focus the the talk on on gender, but there is there is room for rational t debate on this. Yeah, can I land? Well, so I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but honestly, it's, I really care about the clarity. But one of the things that yeah. cross with like people in your audience when it comes yeah. to myself, and it's one of the things we need to fix about the discourse is they will say this person has like taken a, a woke pill and they they are now in a position where you know they're rejecting reality. But what Collins just made clear, and correct me if I'm mistaken, Colin is what he's made clear is, no, it's not people like Steve are rejecting reality. Rather, what it is, is they see greater utility in a different definition. Okay. That is a vital thing that we need uh, to fix okay. in order to progress the conversation. I don't know if you agree, Colin, but I think okay. that's a big problem. So, actually, so I, you mentioned the word utility like 10 times. I'm not sure if utility should be the concept that's invoked for this. I'm happy to consider it as a possibility. I have to secure the definitions before I do anything else. So if the question is, 
can can two rational people yeah two rational people can disagree about it about about uh how uh, you know if victor stein word how a word is used if it should be this word or that word yeah that that's fine and that's that's one of the points of making sure that we go over this in tremendous detail to make sure that everybody's on the same page and i don't want to put any new terms in i don't want to put utility in i don't want to put gender in i just want to make sure that every time we move forward when you use the word woman everybody knows what you're talking about when he uses the word woman everybody knows what everybody what he's talking about i just want to make sure that there's a fundamental understanding yeah we've done that okay so then let's go back up again squeeze it up read uh, well, what I was going to do is I was going to ask if they agreed with, because I hadn't asked if they agreed with the definition. I just asked if they understood it. I think you did. Huh? Did it? Yeah, I, I would like to do that. Um, I think it's, again, I, that's why I've said if, multiple times that I just want to spend the time that it takes to go through this mm -hmm. so that there's no confusion later. So, uh, Colin, do you have a disagreement with Stephen's definition of man? Uh, yes. I don't think it's uh, a, a, a good or uh, ethical definition of, of man. Okay. Can you please tell him why? Because I, I guess I sort of reject the premise that the notion of being a man or a woman has nothing to do with biology and everything to do with identity. Um, I think that it's important to root these concepts, man and woman, in biology because uh, I believe that a lot of the oppression that people have faced, women especially, has been on the basis of their biological sex and not necessarily how they happen to identify. Um, and so this idea that a man and a woman um, are defined sort of, let me see, by uh, what you said, is if they live up to a social construct um, that includes the biology, behavior, phenotype, and aesthetics, uh, of the, of what we consider to be, you know, feminine or, mas or masculine. Um, I, I view this as a regressive definition of what being a man or a woman means, not living up to these sort of uh, stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. Uh, I think it's better to take the, the liberal approach that we've maybe had 10 years ago, well, at least most people had, where a woman was just... Sorry, go ahead. So he gave a criticism of that idea. Do, do you agree with the criticism of the, of, of the definition? What do you mean by agree with the criticism of the definition? Like understand the criticism? No. Or do you understand the criticism? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. What do you think of the criticism? What's your... yes. Okay. So just so I, I, I'm make, making sure I'm not crossing my wires. Uh, when you guys were responding to what I had to say about Aristotelian metaphysics, um, you said that you weren't interested and so moved on. And this is where Colin uh, drops a couple of um, entailments of uh, the regressiveness was just pointed out, like going backwards, focusing on things that women or men should have in terms of aspects and behaviors, which we've been fighting against, right? It's what we've been trying to move against. Is it fair that the, the criticism there, the second one, uh, Colin, that's, that's basically capturing what you, um, what you were saying in that response to me? Yeah, I believe so. We should remove the the social pressure, but that doesn't necessarily make you neither a man or a woman if you don't live up to. So your first point, and I want to make sure I understand this, your first point is that the definition should be rooted in biology. Is that correct? I think first and foremost, yes. Okay, and then your secondary point is that it's regressive, the definition. Yes, I believe so. I believe I believe non-biological versions, uh, definitions are inherently regressive. Okay, so let's give him an opportunity to respond to that. So, yeah, she will. The idea that the definition of man should be rooted in biology, mm -hmm. what is your response to call it? I'd like to get a bit of clarity, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, what do you mean by rooted in biology? It's rooted in the fact that uh, a man must at least be biologically male. Okay, so it sounds like that criticism is that my view is not your view. Is that... Because, like... My view is not your view, and I believe the way you've constructed your view is socially regressive. So that, that objection, please correct me if I'm mistaken, that doesn't seem to actually give me a reason to doubt my definition. It's, it's merely an expression of, I disagree with you, and 
you the, re, the, the way that you would back that up is if we start talking about uh, specific cases and that's when you'll be able to like build up the fact that it is rooted in biology and thus there's a problem with my definition would, would that be fair it, it requ- on its own it's not doing much it requires something to feed into it because i'm not seeing the criticism per se there uh well my criticism i think it's regressive that if we're defining ma- uh, what a man and a woman is according to stereotypes of masculinity and femininity but isn't that a second objection so the first objection you right. have it's a sexual in type. biology the second objection is that it's regressive and i want to get to the regressive regressive that's amazing but the, with the f- i think it's a more useful definition to root it in biology okay but isn't that you just saying i don't like your view like there's not that's not your second one with regressive is a criticism of my view and we'll unpack it but your first one i don't see how that's actually an objection to my view yeah i i i disagree with your view i think it is it differs it's it's a radical departure from what we've sort of been organizing societies around in the past for i think very good reasons okay i think i think we've hit bedrock that's great so would it be fair to say that that objection is more along the lines of your view is a massive divergence compared to what we've used in the past yes and also i think the the definition we've used in the past were less regressive i it's, I, I don't like it just because it's what we've done before if if i thought your thing was better in some way that i'd be happy to adopt a new world view Okay, so now I want to make sure I understand this. So your criticism is the definition of man should be rooted in biology. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the reason, why should the definition of man be rooted in biology? Not just man, but man and woman, because I think there are, yeah, I think there are certain contexts in society where, uh, you know, we, we should be taking into consideration into consideration. Uh, the very real and large sex differences uh, between males and females. Specifically, it's more for for females and, you know, having protected spaces. Uh, you know, there was a history where they weren't able to vote. They weren't able to own property. Uh, and this was based on the fact that they were biologically female, not necessarily just whether they conformed to certain stereotypes. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So your disagreement with that definition deals with the consequent primarily the consequences and secondarily the fact and maybe i'm if i'm reading this into your view and this is not correct it please correct me immediately is that if it's rooted in biology it's not arbitrary but anything else it would be arbitrary that that's kind of implicit what i heard in that if it's not rooted in arbitrary uh sorry if it's not rooted in biology uh, I believe the definition becomes socially regressive because uh, it then therefore defaults to relying on stereotypes. Okay, so it's the consequences. Okay, okay. I, I think I understand now. Uh, oh, okay, uh, one more clarifying question. Um, hopefully just one more. Um, what, as, what, as many as you want. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what specifically do you mean by bio- biology? The, the, the state of being either male or female. Not to do with phenotype. Not to do with, not to do with phenotype. All chromosomes, it's to do with, going back to the definitions that you gave, it's to do with having the physiological apparatus to produce, in this case, small gametes, even if they don't work. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. You know, add one more little nuance, <laughs> if you'd like, in that while I think that our laws should be uh, as closely matched onto biological reality as possible, um, there could be some wiggle room for sort of legal definitions of male or female, uh, you know, a, 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 some degree of legal fiction in very rare instances, you know, maybe for certain intersex conditions uh, where, you know, for all societal intents and purposes, these individuals should maybe be legally considered uh, a sex that they are not. Okay. Okay, cool. So we can, there's a lot to unpack. Yes, um, correct. Where would you, where, where, okay, let's start with this. So, the objection itself is that it should be rooted in biology. So allow me to unpack um, my definition. So I have a view of what I want gender to be, and then I have a view of what it is, right? And so my definition here accounts for that. So by my lights, I actually don't think that gender is a very useful thing. And I think as we've moved on, and as we've, as we've realized we don't want to assign certain aesthetics or behaviors or e- expectations onto people, we're actually heading towards gender abolitionism, which is something that I would endorse. I think that's fine. Um, however, that's not the way it is 
in the world and including the Anglosphere, right? So when we look at uh, what's, what my definition is saying there, it's saying that it's a man is someone who lives up to a social construct that is typically associated with phenotype. Phenotype has almost all of the biological concern that you have. The vast majority of people that are men are also males. That's, that's contained in my definition. It's something to, to be expected. The reason I use phenotype instead of, say, biology or um, uh, physiological apparatus, you know, such as the, uh, uh, in this case, it would be testicles, is because I do not think that's actually how we've had gender roles assigned and behaved throughout history. I mean, put it this way, we didn't know about gametes until I think it was about 1700s. We didn't know about chromosomes until um, uh, the beginning of the t uh, 20th century. And so what was happening back with a Saint Aquinas, what was happening back with Aristotle, they were making judgments based on typically genitalia, but as you know, some of them are ambiguous, which is why they get some of it wrong. But the biggest one was phenotype, is secondary sexual characteristics that they were making the assumption on. So I think that my definition is actually the one that people have been using throughout history. It's because we didn't have uh, access to the information to action base it on biology. Okay, pause on that. So I want to look at that claim. And Stephen, I want to make sure I got this right. Colin, you said before that the, uh, the definition, that this is an ahistorical definition. Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong. And you're saying it's not an ahistorical definition. Yes, I'm saying... Is that uh, correct? I, th I, think, I think that's fair, yeah. I'll, I'll correct if... Uh... Okay. So I want to give Colin an opportunity to respond to that. So, I mean, it is correct that we've used proxies for sex in the past because, you know, we're not looking at people, you know, we're not doing tissue samples to see if they have testes or ovaries. Uh, but the overwhelmingly vast majority of people, uh, you can use certain proxies for their sex by, by observing their genitals. And it's almost always, you know, a, a good indicator if they're male or female. Um, it's still the case that, you know, women were discriminated against based on based on their biology, based on their reproductive, you know, whether, whether or not someone believed that they were biologically male or female, even if we didn't know, uh, you know, in the past about the existence of, you know, the, the fundamental property of what males and females were. Um, one more additional thing to this, too, is even if we can say that some people might be wrong uh, in very rare edge cases of diagnosing somebody's sex, uh, this idea that we shouldn't use sort of biology at all blows open the doors to saying that, well, we can just call people who have no complications or DSDs or whatever, uh, you know, we might as well call them males or females or man or woman, and it's completely arbitrary. Okay, p p I'm sorry, p pause for that. So I just want to go with the first thing that he said was the historical. So you, you said that they were proxies for something else, right? Proxies for sex. And we didn't have the technology, although he didn't use the word technology for that. Um, is that. Is that fair to say? Oh, it sounds like Colin has an essentialist view of language. That he thinks that we were referring to something that actually is the case, like somehow, like there is there is necessary and sufficient conditions for the gender, and what was happening is people were just getting it wrong. Um, is that fair, Colin? I'm not sure I understood that criticism. So uh, it's more understanding um, the view that you're, I think, you're espousing. And that is that you have an essentialist view of what was going on. So my, my light would say, by, by what, how I understand it, is someone would just make an assumption, assign gender, if you will, based on a combination of genitalia and secondary sexual characteristics. And that's what gender was throughout all of human history. And I think it still is this. Um, actually, the newer discoveries we've, we've had uh, are not the right place to be. Uh, to be. Whereas it sounds like what your view is, is that actually they were wrong to assign that gender to that person because that really what gender is at bedrock is the same thing, it seems, as sex. It has to have that biological component. So actually they were just wrong about it um, because all along they were basing their roles not on the secondary sexual characteristics, not on the phenotype, not on the aesthetics, not on the behaviors. They were actually basing it on whether or not they had those ovaries or testicles inside them, despite all other factors. Well, I would say they were basing it on their perceived sex. They could be wrong to some degree. I mean, mistakes happen, even though by using that proxy, they're almost always going to be correct. 
um, you know, save for just a very few like edge cases where they might they might be confused. Okay, so now I'm I'm unclear. So has that been historic? How has the term historically been used? We could do it this way, right? So you don't know uh, my chromosomes, you don't know, uh, you haven't seen my genitalia, anything like that, right? Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad as well, and I would leave you in horror. However, uh, when you meet me, w w how, how do you assess my gender? I don't, well, I don't know, you keep using the word gender, and I'm, I'm tr I'm, I promise you I'll get to that. Well, that, uh, that, that addresses literally your question, right? Um, the question is, how do you assess that? Well, I'll let Colin answer that question. Um, again, we have disagreements on like how we view gender. I would say I, I would look at you and I would assume that you're male because you have male secondary secu sexual characteristics. You have facial hair and all this stuff. I can't know 100%, but I, I can know pretty much. You know, I, I, be, I can be maximally certain of your sex based on uh, these proxies, these sex markers. So it seems... Th let, allow me to introduce an analogy, if you will, um, which I think we'll, we'll get at where our disagreement is here. Uh, suppose that you had a culture, and what this culture did is it decided, or it, it thought, that its money was made of two alloys, or say three alloys, let's say, three alloys. And what happens is they've been spending this money buying property, buying slaves back then, doing whatever they do with their money, right? And then what happens later is we learn with a bit of science the way that they understood the alloys is false actually two of those are the same one so what we've now learned is that they had a two alloy coin not a three alloy coin or something along this proximity right the question is does that invalidate all of the purchases that happened or were they right or is money a social construct and because it's a social construct it, it really is ingrained in them not in the external thing that they think that they're referring to. Okay, and that analogy extends to the definition of man or the fact that man, man should be rooted in biology how? Uh, the way that that extends is, likewise, just as they were spending this money thinking it was one way, you could say that in the past that they were assigning sex and gender based on what, what, they, what we now understand to being the the ovaries, the gamma type, etc. Okay, I'm going to give... Stephen just talked about coins, ally, etc., and I wanted to give Colin you an opportunity to respond to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure on the relevance of that because, you know, even though we're not, again, looking at whether someone has testicular tissue, uh, males and females are still real categories and, you know, we currently have sort of our laws and society set up to account for the real biological differences that come with being male or female. And so to subvert that or flip it on its head, uh, you know, it has, has many, you know, bad consequences for, for society. Like most women uh, or women are biologically female. That's an important distinction. They deserve to have certain spaces that, you know, protect the fact that, you know, they're going to be uh, less strong on average, that they're more susceptible to sexual violence, that type of thing. So there are just pragmatic reasons uh, for why we would want to, you know, acknowledge the reality of sex. So I just want to make sure that I understand this. So you you just said, and if I got this wrong, I apologize, correct me if I'm wrong. You just said that male and female are real categories? Yes. Is that male and female or man and woman? Well, I think man and woman are real categories because I think men and women, it, it is something to be an adult human, male or female. Okay, so I want to take that claim and ask yeah. Stephen to respond to that, please. So the, the, the problem I see here is that because you're criticizing my view, you have to assume my premises. And under my, my view, sex and gender are not the same thing. So any concerns about we need spaces for females versus males, um, and we need to assess people based on their... Uh, whether or not they're female rather than male. I don't lose that with my definition because I keep sex the category for that. It's a very important category. It's something that we need to take seriously. So say that you go to the doctors and you have problems of your lungs and you're a trans woman. If you transitioned after viralization, you know, after you experience male puberty, then actually it's really important for your doctor to know this. And so that's why it's important that they have down on their lip, on their, um, on their notes that you're male. Which, would, which in this sense would correlate with 
with the definition that they gave. So it is a real category. Yeah. My view is that sex, okay. sex is a real category. Okay. But gender is a separate thing. Okay. So and you're agreeing. That's a point of agreement that you have no, 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 with Colin, with it, it's a real category. I do agree with him. But what that means is that in this dialectical context, uh, Colin's concerns do not um, have any issue. They shouldn't even be raised because my view accounts for this. So these concerns that Colin's raised, and this is something I've heard from yourself, uh, Colin, a few times, your concerns for making sure we keep female spaces and that we retain a meaningful distinction with sex is something that I'm not at all criticizing. My, my, all, what I'm criticizing is that gender isn't the same thing as sex. I would argue we've known this for a really long time. Um, and when it comes to what gender is, it, it, a necessary condition isn't being female. Like, I, that's what my view is. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I'm going to give you a chance to respond, and then I want to... Uh, we, we, we went over Stephen's definition, and I, and I want to give Stephen a, an opportunity to, to discuss Colin's definition. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, so, Colin, do you have any words before... So my main objection to disentangling whether you're a boy or a girl or a man or a woman from being, uh, you know, male or female, um, and instead basing whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl around whether you live up to certain stereotypes, socially constructed roles and behaviors and mannerisms and aesthetics that are associated with being uh, your sex, that is a regressive notion in my view because this means that if you are not a feminine female, you are no longer a woman. You are instead non-binary, or if you identify with the masculine set of roles, uh, you are you are now instead of a uh, you are a you are a man, and this has real implications. Sort of, so I specifically look at things like uh, gender affirming care and things like that. They will say that if you are the the gender that you identify with, so the roles and behaviors and norms and stereotypes, if that differs from what is typically associated with your sex then you have a mismatch between your gender identity and your physical body. And this is causing kids to be confused about this, and adults, that there's something wrong with them. A mismatch means there's something wrong. But then we have this medical apparatus that says, well, this mismatch can be fixed with you know, giving these sex non-conforming kids hormones and surgeries to ma make their behaviors and stereotypes sort of, or sorry, make their bodies match the behaviors and stereotypes that are uh, you know, associated with their type of, you know, their their internal degree of masculine and femininity. I, I just think that, you know, you had a women's rights movement that was said that women could be masculine, we could be feminine, we can be anything in between. But to say that, well, if you start being masculine and taking on these masculine roles, you're no longer a woman. To me, that is just like, that's why I think that is a sexist notion, because uh, I, I just, it, it gets rid of women's rights. There's no such thing as women's rights in that in that sense. Okay, I'd like to give your you know, like to respond to that. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so this is the criticism of my view that it leads to social regression. Now, you know how, say, we're talking about atheism and theism. Um, you might see a theist that believes in Christianity. That's what they are, but they don't affirm young Earth creationism. One of the dialectical problems I see in this case is that. A lot of people assume that because I affirm trans people, I affirm some other view. Normally, it's normally a, it's normally a minority view that's held by people that get a lot of airtime because you can make a lot of views by, frankly, taking the piss out of stupid people. Um, <laughs> I don't have um, uh, that view, so of course I'm not going to defend it. My view still affirms trans people, but it's not uh, that view. So I guess what I would ask or the way I can clarify it, is that my definition, which is someone who lives up to a social construct that's typically associated with phenotype aesthetics and behaviors, the word typical is put in there because they're not necessary and sufficient conditions. I don't think that there are necessary and sufficient conditions to this, just as many social constructs work this way as well. Rather, if I had it the way that I wanted it, there's no aesthetics, there's no behaviors, there's not even an association with phenotype. I do not think that gender is a useful thing. I think, I, I honestly think that the, the, our best bet is to get rid of it because of all the wonderful um, uh, critiques that you've just raised. It's, it doesn't help. However, if you, if you base it on society and the way that society works right now, so it's a descriptive state, not a prescriptive state, it is the case that we base it on phenotype, aesthetics, and behaviors. They and, you, and it's a cluster definition of what people fit 
in order to qualify as being a man and a woman. Um, but because you don't have to do it, I don't see how that's uh, regressive. It's just, it's more of a description of what is the case. Most women have long hair, especially when they're young. Uh, most men, um, you know, they're, they're taller than women. Like these are perfectly fine things to say, but because you're using the language such as most and typical, you're not saying that they're necessary conditions. Okay, so I'm gonna give you last word, unless you want the last, last word, and then I wanna keep moving down here. So I, I view that as, as sort of a liberal escape hatch <laughs> to avoid sort of the consequences of what gender ideology actually says. Because yeah, we can, they always can go back to this, like, well, you don't have to conform to any of these stereotypes to still be a man or a woman. But when you look at the definitions used by, you know, the ones you put forth, you know, typically associated within the expressions and the aesthetics, this is like what WPATH and everything say too, you know, the, the stereotypes that are associated with your particular culture. I mean, that says something. We tend to know, and even if it's not this definitive, you know, it's a cluster of characteristics, we have in our minds sort of what femininity is. Like, whatever femininity is, it's not Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Okay, whatever masculinity is, it's not just a, a princess in a gown, you know, hold, balancing books on her head or something like that. You know, those there are certain things we can diagnose as being masculine or feminine and certain things that, you know, would be ridiculous to call those things. And so when we say that the things that are typically associated with you know, males and females, the social roles, expectations, aesthetics, you, we have a good idea of what that is. You, you can't just say like, well, you know, you can actually do anything. It doesn't really matter because there is this cultural I idea of what masculinity and femininity is to some degree. It's not this completely undiagnosable thing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that would be my criticism. I think it's just pretending to not know what masculine and feminine traits typically are and how they present. So I have to give you an opportunity to respond to that before we go on. Sure. Reed, if you'd be so kind, can you go back to my definition? Um... What? Can you read it, please? I can, I can. Someone who lives up to a social construct that is typically associated with phenotype, aesthetics, and behaviors. Um, the criticism that you just conveyed, how is it that my view entails the problems that you see? Could did you mind expanding upon that? Yeah, because if you say the aesthetics, the biology typically associated with being male or female... You know, we, we do have certain cultural norms that we associate with males and females. With females, we have, you know, being passive, uh, you know, being being weak, being agreeable, being all these things um, that, you know, to some degree maybe are have some biological component to them, what creates these stereotypes in the first place. But then to say that, well, the individuals who aren't conforming to these stereotypes um, aren't actually, you know... The, a man or a woman, or if they're sort of androgynous and they're expressing themselves, you know, they're just sort of masculine, sort of feminine, maybe both, maybe they change it uh, to that they're no longer men and women. Um, this this seems to me to be very regressive because you're defining what a man and a woman is according to the stereotypes of a given culture. Therefore, like a woman who cuts her hair short, well, that's not a hairstyle that's typically associated with being, you know, biologically female. Uh, this is now a person who is considered transgender or, or non-binary. So how does my view say that? Because like my, my view doesn't say that you have to do this. It's just describing what it is in Western civilization, what it is pretty much across the world. I'm not saying that you have to have long hair. I'm not saying you have to behave in a certain way. I'm not even saying that you have to have secondary sexual characteristics. I'm just saying that if you want a definition that broadly captures it all, that's a good one to go for. Like I'm not... My view isn't telling people what to do. Like all, of, all of your concerns, all of your grievances for the way that we've boxed women in, particularly women, and what we've done is we've forced them to have roles, and men as well. We've expected them to be a certain way, not show emotion, etc. These things are not good. This is why, by the way, ultimately, I'm a gender abolitionist. I don't want it. I don't want these expectations put on people. But if we're describing what it is in society, it's like, I'm in a room right now, and every, every male in here has short hair. So it's fair to say that that's part of the aesthetic. Well, that's actually not entirely true. That's not, it's fine. <laughs> we, we, got, we, got, we got a lovely bald man. But, but that is, that's just a description. I'm not saying it should be that way. I'm just trying to, it's like when I describe a castle, I'm not telling you that it, it has to be this way. I'm just giving you a definition of the way that it is. And because I'm not prescribing anything, there's nothing 
regressive about it. So, so that's so that's not your definition of what a man or a woman is. Then that's just a definition you think is out there that you don't agree with. Well, this one on, on that I've just read. Yeah, that's not your definition. That that is how I see gender. That's that is what's going on in society. So then, how would you how would you classify, say, a female who just had all of the behaviors and aesthetics with, that we typically associate with being a biological male, just the most masculine person you can imagine? Yeah. So, like, if you had someone who had very masculine secondary characteristics, they didn't live up to the aesthetics that's typically associated with. Uh, women and they didn't have the behaviors that typically associated with women i would i can account for that because i'm saying my definition is that they typically associated this how would you what would you call that person is that person a woman i'd ask them i just go what's your pronouns or or, or i would make an assumption like yourself like if they really presented as masculine like what you were saying peter i would just call them a dude and then if they correct me i'll go okay thanks like that's fine i mean but under this idea the words man and woman have literally no meaning whatsoever. I mean, if, if someone could be literally the most masculine person in the world and be a female, and you would just uh, go ahead and accept the fact that they just describe themselves as a woman, well, then that is just a, a noise that has no referent in reality. And I don't see how we can even talk about what men and women are unless there's some anchor. Yeah, because yeah. So that's um. So can you respond to that, Club? Yeah, yeah. So, so the anchor is getting at the description of what it is. So if you look at how Western society does does define um, a man or woman according to the way that I look at it, then you're right. You you run into that situation. Whereas if you do it by the way that I would prefer, because I've got the prescriptive part, I just wouldn't have gender. I don't think it's very helpful in that situation. So w when you describe when someone tells you that they are a woman, what does that mean to you? If they say I'm a cis woman, what does what does that mean to you? Well, cis cis is going to be like. Well, we didn't. We did not put that on the board. Just to be fair, no, no, no. But like, a, a, it's a fair question, right? So, a cis woman is like it's a, a newer word. It's uh, being, I think it was from the seventeens. It's being used to describe people who are not trans, right? So you know how we've got heterosexual and homosexual, and we invented those words. It's the same thing, right? We've invented new terminology to be able to make up a way to be able to talk about these things. So that's the cis part covered. Um, but if someone came up to me and they said that they're a woman. I would assume that they're using a definition that's like the self ID view, which is saying that there's no there's no necessary conditions and there's not even any really descriptions at all. The self ID view is going to want to tell you that the only thing that are, that pertains to gender is how one identifies, and they can't even give you attributes outside of themselves because the second they do that, they're starting to say that it's you know associated with things and whatnot. Uh, that's one of the reasons I don't buy the self identification view. So, so this isn't your definition then of male of, of man and woman. This is a definition that's out there that you want to abolish. No, no, because the, the self, the concerns that you've been expressing, pertain to self identification. So, and, and what are they identifying with? Sorry, go ahead. Well, well, this is it. Like the self identification movement, what they're going to want to tell you, which is just one one uh, party, if you will, that's pro trans, which I'm I'm not part of. I'm part of a different one. What they would be telling you is that gender doesn't have any necessary or sufficient conditions other than your identity. And for all of the grievances you have with that, I probably share them all, which is why I don't have that definition. My definition is someone who lives up to a social construct that typically associates with phenotype aesthetics and behaviors. And I'm not seeing where there is an, an, an issue here because the word typical is doing a lot of heavy lifting it's a bit like with mammals right we discovered the platypus we changed the definition of mammal essentially to put typical in because we're like okay there's a few exceptions that's one of the reasons typical is involved in a lot of definitions especially when it comes to social constructs so i think where i depart from what you're saying is because you have a slightly modified version of what is being said by sort of a lot of our major scientific medical organizations of how they define what the gender binary is and what it means to be uh, transgender, for instance. So in this, so but from WPATH and these organizations, they will define the gender binary as this idea that there are two and only two genders. Those are called men and women. And that, I'm reading this here, the expectation that everyone must be one or the other and that all men are males and all women are females and masculine and, and, and femininity links with that. Um, 
so according to this view, a male or a female, or sorry, a man and a woman are individuals who conform to these stereotypes, who conform to these binary socially constructed roles that in a culture is typically associated with being male or female. And then they define being transgender as people whose gender identities and or gender expressions are not what is typically expected for the sex to which they were assigned at birth. So this is just transgendering individuals who are just, you know, sex non-conforming to any, any degree, really, if they're not conforming to what is typically associated with their sex. Um, and this is what I believe is an incredibly regressive view, because again, this says that a boy or a girl or a man or a woman who does not conform to these stereotypes associated with their sex is not a man or woman, or they're of the opposite sex, or they're or, or opposite gender, or they're neither. They're non-binary. So a non-binary person is not claiming to be intersex. They're claiming to be rejecting those stereotypical roles that we call man and woman that are associated with being, you know, masculine and feminine. And to therefore to say that, you know, I'm a sex non-conforming girl or a woman, I reject those stereotypes associated with being a woman, therefore I'm no longer a woman. That is where I get off the train with this ideology because uh, that is that is the straight, most straightforward reading of it. Let's give stuff an opportunity to respond to that. All of your concerns about assigning to people that they must have certain aesthetics or must have certain behaviors or they must look a certain way, which is partly aesthetic, partly to do with phenotype. Yeah, I agree with you. This is one, one of the problems with the dialect, and that is that what happens is people can get views and get clicks if they can put up what I would argue are the worst arguments for affirming trans people or the worst positions, such as self-identification, because that's one that I don't buy. And that's one I would I would see as being implicit here. And what they do is it encourages people to go, okay, so therefore we can do away with the whole thing. But the dialect, by my light, that's like going, young earth creationism is nonsense, therefore Christianity is not true. And that's just not how it works, right? Because there's going to be other views and other arguments and other positions which are going to be making sense of the data. What I would need is how my view specifically has these problems because i agree with what you're saying i think that they those problems do hit um the other views but not my view. so you you've given your view you've inserted what i call like that liberal escape hatch where even though like being a man or a woman is what's typical associated with it you will just still like pull the escape hatch and escape any situation where someone is not typically you know looking masculine or feminine at all and also this is a woodfordian gender ideology your view here is completely out of step with the CDC, with the a American Academy of Pediatrics, with WPATH. And these are the organizations that are pushing this regressive ideo ideology that if you are not conforming to these gender stereotypes, you are trans. You have a mismatch between your, uh, ex you know, your, your gender identity and your, your physical sex. And so this is why I criticize this so much is because this is what's being pushed top down by all our scientific and medical institutions. And if you disagree with that, that's great. I would just hope that you join me in criticizing all of this nonsense that's coming down from above, rather than creating your own Woodfordian gender theory and with an escape hatch where you can just say, no, we, we're not we're not held to any of these uh, uh, ideas of identifying with stereotypes. Okay, let's deal with the escape hatch first. So your definition of a female was one that is that had the escape hatch of them not actually having to have functional biology. Rather, it, they just have to have the biology. I wouldn't call it an escape hatch because I think that that is one of the dialectical problems. You saying that I have an escape hatch, to me, is essentially uh, what's going on there. Like, it's not an escape hatch. It's it's not like um, I've hidden it. It's not like I'm, oh, I'm, the, the walls have been breached, so I'm going to pick up and jump. It's right in front of you. Like, that isn't quite literally what my view is telling you. It's... It's why typical is added to mammal um, because of the platypus. It's it's that's what. So the the hatch one I'm not getting. Perhaps like the audience can correct us on that because I do want to move on to criticizing your view. Yes, yes. The second point. But we we have to wrap up part one soon. But we will certainly do that. But I want to give you I want to give you an opportunity to to address the rest of it. Uh, sure. So the second thing is what view is held by by uh, these establishments by these people. 
that is something that's quite hard to gauge, right? So like if you take a poll of philosophers, uh, I don't know if you would think, if it sounds like you wouldn't think that philosophers really should be having a say on this conversation. Um, but if you take philosophers, they are, um, most of them will say that sex and gender are not the same thing. They don't have this biological view. Um, and so there's plenty of people that are outside of it. Now, as for how many of them are affirming the specific views that, that you're mentioning, that's a little bit of a difficult one to take. But I, I should say this, and that is that you guys made a response to me having a conversation with Forrest Balkai. And if the grievance is that my view is different, well, I argued with Forrest and him actually having this difficult view that you are mentioning uh, on everything, including sports, including uh, children and transitioning. I argued with him throughout. And if you'd watched the video, then it would have been really clear that my view isn't um, something that is, is put across by people getting the clicks by finding what I would argue is the nuts. All right, we need we need to end the uh, we need we need to end part one now. Uh, Stephen, I'll I'll give you a, a choice. Do you want to let him have the last word in part one? Because if he does, then you'll get the last word in part two. Uh, Colin, it sounds like you wanted to make a, a rejoinder. You go ahead, and then we'll move on to and then we'll go we'll take a break. I uh, yeah, have criticisms of your view. Okay. Um, I guess I would. <laughs> my last comment would say then, under your your framework, I don't know that man and woman has any referent in reality whatsoever. Um, it's a, it's a non, they're nonsensical words. They're just, they're just noises at that point. All right. We're going to take a break. Part one, part two, you can respond. You can come back with a response to that, but we're at the hour, right? Are we at the hour? Sorry. It, I, I think it would be remiss not just to hit this quickly. Okay. Then, hold, hold okay. Go ahead. Then he's going to, I'm going to give him the word after of you. Of course. And that's it. Because Lots of definitions of social constructs have this kind of thing in it. So if we were to define what a castle is, we'd say a castle is typically something that was built for a noble. It is something that is typically built with fortification. It is typically built with um, wanting to house weaponry. And the reason we use that definition is because of looking at the world and trying to find a definition that fits. But it sounds like because it's got the escape hatch, which is something that I would argue pretty much all social constructs have, that you see that as a problem. Whereas I just, I don't see that as a problem for castles. I don't see that as a problem for gender. All right, I'm going to give you the last word before we break, Colin. It's just because you gave what you consider your definition of what man and woman is based on what is typically associated, you know, with the sexes. Uh, and then I presented you with a case where there was a female who was the most masculine and most male typical in behaviors and aesthetics you could possibly imagine. And you said that this person could still very well be 100% a woman. Um, and I, I, that makes no sense to me. Okay. Un under the descriptive element uh, of the definition, no, they wouldn't. Is that, is that, is that what you're getting at? So, sorry, again, it seems that you don't actually agree with the definition of man and woman that you're presenting. You're saying that that is a definition that is out there that some people who are kind of regressive use, and you wish to abolish that. But that is not your definition. You don't have a definition of man or woman because a man or woman for you can be absolutely anything. And there's nothing you can say that would invalidate it. Is that your definition? Oh, it, it must be that I haven't been clear throughout. I, what I'm saying... Because I spent so much time... <laughs> what, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I mean, to be clear, I, I see the cow. I've, I've said that you will have a description of what something is and then you may have your own view of what it should be. So if I'm describing what gender is, that is my definition. And it's going to have entailments that I'm not going to like. Wait, wait what's your definition of man, not gender? Uh, no, if I had my ideal world, I would have no gender. Um, I'm a gender abolitionist. I don't think it's useful for all of the reasons that you've pointed out. I think it's just not useful. Now, is, is sex useful? Of course, it's, of course it's useful. It's something you need to know. But I don't find that gender is a useful construct yeah so there, there's some agreement there then because i would agree that we shouldn't have you know those people shouldn't be forced or coerced to uh, associate with these socially regressive uh you know con constructed roles of masculine masculinity and femininity i'm all there on board where i get off is that i wouldn't therefore say that this you know makes them not men or women or that you know that we that we should all just call ourselves non-binary um because I, I reject that framework of putting, you know, that man and woman are those social constructs. 
Um, uh, that is a construct that I reject. But I, I, I just, and since I use the definition of man and woman as according to biology, I just think that we should have masculine men and women and, uh, sorry, uh, males and females that are a, a wide range of masculine and femininity, and that's okay, and people should just be able to express themselves according to they want to, but it doesn't make them not males or females, or not man or woman. Hey everybody, this is part two of the conversation between Colin Wright and Stephen Woodford, and you can find part one, I don't know if we'll, how we'll release these, but certainly either, I don't know how we're gonna release Maybe it, together, I'm, maybe separate with the group. Yeah, we, we don't know. So we just left off, I have many questions in my head as one would expect from this kind of conversation. I will say it's the most detailed conversation I personally have ever seen on this. Uh, and, I, and I'm finding it very, very helpful. So we just l left off in which Colin had an opportunity to talk about Stephen's definition, and now I want Stephen to have an opportunity to address issues around Colin's definition of man, and then I'd like to do the other terms below. But right now, um, Colin, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but welcome back. Um, you gave the definition of man as adult human male. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Uh, and we also secured questions and and not agreement, but everybody already we already went over. Everybody uh, understands. Okay. So I want to give you an opportunity to ask Colin any question you want about that this definition. Okay. Sure. Okay. So it sounds like you've put across three conditions that must be met in order to be considered a man. The first is adult, the second is human, the third is male. So that's correct, right? All three of them you must have in order to be a man. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. So if I can show you that one of your um, criterions is a social construct, would you agree that that renders your actual view a social construct? I would say it, it depends. I would need it here. Okay. Okay, fair. So, I, yeah, I think what might be best then to do at first is <clears throat> let's unpack what a male is, which is the definition you've given, so we can get that back on board. What specifically must someone have to get that uh, node, that necessary condition? What well, must they have? Male. Male. Yeah. Okay, so he gave that mm -hmm. before, so I'd like to read that myself. Uh Colin's definition of male, and, and if you've, um, I just want to call, just to, to, we've already gone over this, but it's helpful to go over it again. Someone whose primary reproductive organs, in parentheses, testicles, are organized around or have the function to produce small gametes, and in parentheses, sperm. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, can you keep it on board? About, sorry, just for a sec. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Cheers. So yeah, so someone whose primary reproductive organs, testicles, are organized around or have the function uh, to produce small gametes. So first of all, I have co concerns that are of an epistemic level, so how we figure this out, and then I have concerns about the ontology of it all. Um, is it fair to say that your definition is saying that they don't have to have ever been able to actually produce sperm, it's just they have to have uh, the testicles. Basically, if you have testicles, that's it. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't need to be functional. In humans, we're called gonochoric species, so our sexes uh, are dispersed into their own individuals as opposed to like a hermaphroditic species. So we can call entire individuals males or female if they have uh, sort of that reproductive setup. What, what happens if they don't have testicles? So if they have them removed after the fact... That wouldn't, in my view, change their sex because this is a developmental process. It's your genes becoming expressed any more than like bleaching the, you know, the stripes of a tiger. We wouldn't make it less of a tiger or something like that. Um, so if they've expressed the, if they've developed testes, that's sort of what their expression of their phenotype is. Um, they would be biologically male, even if they're non-functional. So would that be fair to say that the definition is someone whose primary reproductive organs, testicles, are or were organized around having um, the function to produce full gametes? Uh, or would be. So when you say were, that doesn't... I wouldn't maybe say were, but I would say if, if they've sort of developed to function uh, to produce small gametes, that's sufficient. Because you get, if you have like sequential hermaphrodites, for instance, 
sometimes they were a male and they trend, they they became female and so like well they used to be a different sex if you say if they were you know a, like a, a a female clownfish previously produced uh sperm but no longer does but her primary reproductive anatomy has has changed to ovaries so if you have it so that there's some species such as a clownfish that can turn from having the organs that are, that are not testicles and then they have them that would clarify if they're having them at the moment so whose primary reprodu uh, reproductive organs are whereas if you had someone that had the ability but lost it such as you lose your testicles uh you could cover it by saying that they were that's what i'm getting at from that yeah it's, it's all coded through development they have you know the, the they, they've developed these uh over in, in their lifetime and just merely like what they would call in the literature like uh you know acquired characteristics like you know getting a limb chopped off or something that's that's not it doesn't make you no longer a tetrapod bleaching you know a tiger stripes doesn't make them no longer a tiger you're still a red-bellied thrush if you're you know if someone paints your red belly black or something like that so where you would say gender and sex are about this specific thing to do with uh, testicles. In the case of, me of, of me being man slash male, it's about testicles. Um, when it comes to the structure of society, such as bathrooms, um, are you saying the bathroom should be segregated based on this? Or so I just want to pause. So we we have not developed. So Reed put on gender, which is one of the words I would also want to do, but we have not gone over that. Would it be helpful to you if we did gender now, or do you want to continue with the line of questioning? So Colin, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but because Colin's view of gender being so closely associated with sex, uh, in fact, sex is a necessary condition. If I'm ever talking about sex i am actually talking about uh so do you want to, they're going to have an impact on the way do you want to do gender? gender we can put gender up on the board and re reed can write it and then we can each give that your definition of gender no no because i gave my definition of gender and we've we've done that right have we done that did i screw that up yeah is yeah oh you should clarify then you meant man and woman is a such super Okay, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So on, on, on the, okay, oh, cool. So I'm glad, I'm glad we got the clarity. So under Colin's view, man and male mean the same thing. Is that is that fair or, or like man? Yeah, not exactly because man has as one of its necessary conditions male. So if you start to, if there's a problem with male, it's going to feed into the definition of his man because it's one of his necessary attributes. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, it's going to affect it for sure. Okay. Okay. Cool. No. Yeah. That is cool. Thanks. Yeah. So just to clarity, like my view would specify the man and woman I use referring to gender, whereas I'm happy using male female to refer to sex. Whereas I understand that this is just the way that I see it, and this is the way that I want to break it down. The point is, it's language. I'm just trying to convey a concept. As long as you understand what I'm saying, yeah, I just want to make it sure where it's clear as possible. The way that Colin uses the words is the way that um, I'd argue most people. Correct me if I'm mistaken. They would just use man and male interchangeably. They're the same thing. They're synonyms, and m women and females are, are synonyms. Is that fair, Colin? Yeah, they're they're mostly synonyms, except you know you can still be a male and not be uh, an adult or a human, but man is, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Walker. So if we uh, go back to where we was, if you wouldn't mind reminding me, Colin. Uh, organizing society. Yes, okay. So when it comes to organizing society around male, um, how, 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 like for instance, bathrooms, this will be an instance where it'll be interesting to see how the definition works with this. How is it that you can organize bathrooms when, I mean, first of all, would you split it based on man and woman, males, men, uh, males bathroom, females bathroom to use, which I'll, I'll use from now on the definitions that you use? Uh, I think that segregating bathrooms according to sex makes the most sense. Okay, cool. So that means that's consistent. I can see that. Now, here's one of the problems I have. How are you going to enforce that? Um, so I think that would so i think there should be laws that should be put in place for that or at least a social uh agreement that you know an individual who is clearly biologically male uh should feel out of place in there and there should be a major social taboo over doing it there should also be a legal uh you know component of that as well 
but it is admittedly very difficult to enforce. But I think there should be a case where, you know, you see someone who looks incredibly male that, you know, that, that you should be able to go and talk to a manager about that. I just want to go back to this. So I'm clear. So read, go back to the, uh, adult human male. So is the point of contention, and I don't want to put words in the mouth, I'm trying to understand this, is the point of contention the consequences from that or the or the accuracy of that? So, okay, at the beginning, what I hope we got to, and it sounded like we did, is that there is room for rational disagreement. And what we're talking about, it was a word that you didn't like me using, but I think we're talking about utility. Okay. So the utility will come into which definition better accounts for the history, for the data, and for constructing society. Now, one of the reasons I have, as many of the reasons I have a big issue with adult human fema uh, female or adult human male is that I think that when you start breaking it down, you realize that there is a lot of utility problems with it. And okay. that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so just so that I understand, can something have a high utility value and be false? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, so you're issue with this is not that it's adult human male is not that it's false it's that it has a low utility yeah so when it comes to particularly gender because i know we've got male up here right because when it comes to gender my view is that we're talking about utility and and when we're talking about the conditions that make up gender that is where you might fall into areas where there are right and wrong answers about certain things okay. such as sex Okay, so but, I want to put him, I want to put that, okay, so are you accepting that idea that Stephen put forward about utility in terms of the definition adult human male? Um, I think that is an objective defin definition of sex, but we might disagree on the utility of, of whether bathrooms should be uh, segregated on that basis. So just so that I understand, so the reason utility is important is because it deals with the consequences of the definition. It's, it's the it's the art component of the I guess the discussion. I, I guess I guess we could put it this way, right? Say we're trying to find a definition that's useful for castles. The point is is that there are several different definitions that you can use, and the one that we're going to opt to use is the one which makes better sense of the data without having to tack on extra things, without having a problem with actually trying to assess things. So if someone was to define a castle as a old building that was built for a noble, that's a fair definition that's going to capture some of what we mean by castle. But it will fail in some instances, for instance, new castles. It will fail in dealing with uh, buildings that were made not to house a noble. And so what I'm saying is that when it comes to gender, we're talking about which definition has the greatest utility in terms of its historicity, making sense of the data. This is why I push on secondary sexual characteristics being how we assign gender, not we don't actually like cut people open and figure out what their chromosomes or their gonads are. And that's that's why I'm talking about the utility. Now in the context here, I'm forget my view. I'm taking Colin's view. Okay. And I'm I'm he's given us really clear definition of what he means by a man correct and one of those definitions is that they have to be a male and what i'm pushing at here is i'm saying okay if male is a condition and because male is um one of the three necessary things to be a man when it comes to the utility of bathrooms there's going to be an entailment of how the hell do we figure out who is and isn't male oh. and what i'm pushing at here is that there is well, how, how do you do it? How do you determine? Okay, so there's a lot there. I think it's largely done through self-policing because there are certain social taboos and just respecting spaces that, uh, you know, are, are supposed to be designated for, for one sex or the other. Uh, I, I mean, there should be a legal component, I believe, as well, where if, if I'm in a women's bathroom just standing there, uh, I'm going to make a lot of women uncomfortable. I, I think I should be able to get arrested if I'm just hanging out in a women's locker room um, watching people undress or whatever, or just being there and undressing myself and minding my own business, I think I should be able to be forcibly removed from a place like that. So, uh, yeah. And does that relate to your right. definition of uh, of adult human males? Yes, because I'm I'm an adult human male. Uh, I think people should be able to expel me from a women's bathroom. If you get arrested, what, what is it going to be that justifies their arresting you? 
the fact that you are in a, a place that uh, you're not allowed to be legally. Yeah, but how are they going to determine that? Like, because they can't, they can't come in and check your genitalia. Yes, exactly. So I, I do think, and I mentioned this a little earlier, uh, while I think our laws should be reflective of biology as much as possible, there are cases where, you know, your legal sex uh, might be able to be not completely reflective of your biological sex. Say in cases of, of people who have complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome, um, they're biologically male, they have testes, they're internal. Um, but I just think, you know, socially wise, I don't think it really makes much sense to like force them to use the men's room. So there can be exceptions for very rare conditions, I think. Um, but I think biological sex captures almost all of what we're trying to capture when we're making a certain laws of like who should be able to use which bathroom. Even if at the very margins, there could be some blurred areas where some exceptions in law should be able to be made for that. So here, really what I'm giving you is just two objections. One is epistemic and one is ontological. You brought up complete androgen sensitivity syndrome. It sounds like what you would say is someone with a male uh, with complete androgen sensitivity syndrome should be using the woman's bathroom. And so what that means is that you're making an exception or having to tack something onto the view to make up for the exception. And then when it comes to actually being able to figure out who is who does have the condition of having testicles or not having testicles or having testicles but they've been removed, I, the, the epistemic objection is that a society that could figure this out would be incredibly invasive. Like we want to talk about predation or anything like that. It's it's insanely inv 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 uh, evasive, invasive. And so it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, we won't do that. Rather, um, we'll judge it based on um, secondary sexual characteristics. These things here, just on this one topic, by my lights, are just scratching at the surface of why this isn't the way that we define things. And it's also not a good way to define things. Well, the, the secondary sex characteristics, I mean, yeah, we're not checking people's gonads at the door when they walk in there. But we can make we can make very reasonable, uh, extremely accurate assumptions that are almost always going to be the case, where if you see me in a women's bathroom, I mean, I should be forcibly removed. I shouldn't be, you know, having to whip out my <laughs> my testicles and, you know, for them to, you know, see whether or not I should be removed. Um even though, so even though we're using secondary sex characteristics, again, these are a proxy for our biological sex because your sex is, you know, so tightly linked to these secondary sex characteristics. So take, for example, <clears throat> who you gave earlier, the instance of a woman who's very, very butch. So from your lights, you're going to judge them as a man because of the secondary sexual characteristics, and they walk into the woman's bathroom. Are you going to stop them? No, and I've I have heard of some extremely masculine looking women facing that type of discrimination. And, you know, again, this is is it's gonna be almost impossible to create a single rule that's gonna not have any issues around the edges where some people aren't gonna be offended in some situations. But I think if if what we do is just like throw our hands up and say, like, well, nothing's gonna possibly account for every single instance. There, so we should abolish sex or any trait whatsoever to be using bathrooms. Well, that's like the worst of all possible worlds because now it's just a free-for-all and anyone can go anywhere and no one can tell anyone to leave anywhere. Um, I think there's just a pragmatic way we can go about it where, you know, it's not perfect, but it's like the least bad of all situations. Okay, I'm going to give you, if you want to comment, and then I want to uh, read, we'll scrunch it down, and then I want to go over the other half of the, the words that we yeah, asked. Yeah, that sounds good. Um so my view here, obviously we're running out of time, so we can't go too much with the back and forth. But my view is just by taking one of the attributes, sex, and one social situation, which is bathrooms, because obviously we've got so many other things to consider in society when it comes to our categorization. The fact that you're making these exceptions and the fact that you're giving ground to what is essentially my view, which is based on phenotype, these are some of the motivations for why I don't think that that's a very good definition. And actually, the utility is better to use my one. Um, if you want to leave it there with Colin getting the last word to that, and then we move to adult. Uh, I mean, I, I just don't think that basing it on phenotype is going to be the best because, again, that's entering the realm of pure subjectivity where you're going to have, you know, it's a very effeminate male who's just like, oh, I might as well just go and use the women's room. Um, but even though they're clearly male or maybe they think they pass much better than they do, uh, you're, you're still going to make women feel uncomfortable. Uh, there's still sex differences in sort of the behavior and the, the threat of sexual violence they pose to individuals. Um, so 
by my view, that that, that isn't what's going to happen because sex isn't a necessary co um, condition of gender. And I'm, I'm open to if you want to have, I mean, the best case scenario is just have uh, uh, one type of bathroom, that's it. But obviously, that's not something that we built our society around. It's not something that we've got. But my view is that if you want to do it based on sex, you've got room to do that. But the problem is, is the implementation of it. And the fact that once there's a little bit of pressure, we actually reveal that we're not, we don't have society set up to be able to check people's testicles. We don't want society set up to test whether or not they've got this male condition. And it would be incredibly expensive and silly and stupid by my lights. And it sounds like you agree. So it sounds to me that you have to make the exception. You have to go, okay, you know, when it comes to this condition, uh, we have to make an exception to the definition that I choose. Whereas my view wouldn't have that problem. Well, I mean, this this comes to the idea of, um, you know, the, that I think it should be mostly a self-policed activity of people who are biologically male or female, uh, who are policing themselves mostly. I mean, I think there should be a law around it as well. Um, and there should be a social taboo of someone who knows they're male going into a female space. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's... How do they police that, though? Because they know what sex they are. Because individuals know what sex they are. So No, but they can't... Oh, you're saying so the individuals must do it. I think it should be self... I mean, it's it's going to be self-policed in every most cases because you don't have police in every bathroom checking genitals at the door or, or their, their gonads. And so, I mean, largely, it's a social taboo that should be self-policed. I do think there should be a legal component where if, you know, someone like me is just in the bathroom and not moving and it's a lot of women are complaining about it, they should be able to... The not moving part, you mentioned earlier about, like, just looking at people, like, there's, like, a predation element to this. Or if I'm just in there washing my hands, like... Oh, okay, because like the predation part seems to be very strange. Like you get people when they talk about this topic, they speak about trans people as if they're all predators. And it's like, we wouldn't do this with gay people, right? We wouldn't say gay people use the same bathrooms as the gender they're, uh, they're attracted to. Therefore, it's fair for us to set up scenarios where, you know, they're just in there looking at boys. Like we wouldn't do this. That's gross, right? So with the transgender one. I, th I think there should be a legal route to forcibly remove me from a women's room or a locker room. Okay, so I want to, we, we are running out of time, so it's right. So, Reed, scooch it down, please. And then I want to go over the uh, the other definitions of words. Yes, no, adult, please. I want to know if you would be so kind with the second attribute, let's say, which is adult. What is an adult to you? What are the conditions to be an adult? Yeah, so biologically speaking, an adult is an individual who has reached sexual maturity. Now, again, this is adds up a couple little bit of nuance when we're talking about humans. So even though biologically speaking, we're adults that are around, you know, 13 years old, we've sort of agreed as a society that we have something called like a legal, you know, whether you're legally an adult or not. There's something that other animals don't have. Like, you know, your dog doesn't have a legal, legally adult. It's just the strict biological definition uh, of what an adult is. Um, and that's because, you know, we are, we have a society of laws and we can decide that if we want to have a legal adult. So, I mean, it is in a sense a legal fiction because, you know, people who are 13, if, if they've gone through puberty, they are technically adults, but not legally so. So it's once those organs are working. Yeah, once they've reached sexual maturity. The age of... Yeah, so what if someone doesn't reach that? They have a condition that makes it so that they don't reach adulthood and they no longer a woman or a man. Um, I'm not aware of any instance where, you know, people don't reach, like, maturity just because you your gonads aren't functioning. Uh, you know, they're still, like, producing testosterone. They're still becoming, you know, an adult. If a child had to get them removed because they had, I don't know, something, some kind of cancer or some kind of accident, I'm, I'm just curious, like, would... What, how would you account for that in your view? Well, again, removing certain organs after the fact doesn't change your biological sex any more than bleaching a, a tiger's stripes. It doesn't change your sex, but it would, but it would change whether you not whether or not you hit adulthood as you just defined it, because they wouldn't ever get to a point where they're producing the gametes. Um, again, we also have the the concept that we have for for humans of being, uh, you know, a, a legal adulthood as well. So sure, I'm happy to get to the adulthood part uh, with that. And and again, we can we can maybe point to like very rare exceptions uh, where we would say maybe in a very strict biological sense, oh, this individual is has been stunted in their growth, they're neotenous, they've never fully matured. Um, you know, the vast majority of humans do go through puberty; they do sexually mature. Um, and it, it just seems weird just to to try to poke at some sort of very rare exception and saying that therefore this is a completely arbitrary 
uh, thing that we're doing here because it's not completely arbitrary. Yeah, but the, so uh, let's uh, pin the rarity. I think that that's an important part we can get to. But it, it sounds like if your definition of adulthood does require that they get to the point where it is functioning and they don't have the apparatus by the time it would have got to functioning, that definition taken to its conclusion, unless you want to tack something else on, is going to make it so that some people that are, say, 50 are not an adult, according to that view. I mean, maybe in a strict biological sense, if they've if their development has been stunted and they never produce an adult phenotype, uh, then, I mean, maybe in a strict biological sense, you could say that some individuals never achieve adulthood. And I assume you wouldn't allow that person who's technically not an adult to compete in sports which are designed around cis women. No, because again, I don't think our laws necessarily have to be 100% matched to biological reality, even though they should be as informed as much as possible by biological reality, because there are these rare exceptions and we do need to be able to account for those. Sorry, uh, maybe I should, th uh, I think I messed up my question there. So allow me to uh, restate that. If they never hit adulthood, does that mean that they can keep competing in the category that isn't for adults for sports? So like, could you get it? So there's like a, a 30 year old competing against seven year olds. Uh, uh, currently, that's not how our leagues are set up. We just have time as a linear. Yeah, but if we use um, uh, your definition, wouldn't that be another entailment for these rare people? I mean, perhaps in a again in a strict biological sense, if people don't reach maturity, then you know maybe they are yeah they're they're stunted, they're neotenous. Um, but again, then in human society we have what we consider to be, you know the the values that we have and what we're trying to really get at. And when we have like a children's pee wee league, we're trying to get at the fact that. You know, they're of a certain age of both, you know, physical and mental maturity and that type of thing. But I, I just want to push back against the just because, like, there are exceptions to something doesn't mean that, like, it's totally arbitrary. Okay, it's like there's there's there can be fuzzy borders on things, but we can still say that in the overwhelmingly vast majority of cases, there's just no question. I'm going to I'm going to ask a question. So one thing that I wanted to ask before, but it'll want to interrupt Stephen's line of questioning is it seems to me I want to start synthesizing uh, agreements and disagreements pretty soon but one thing you said Colin that I and I could totally be wrong about this that I think is a fundamental point of disagreement or contention you use the word anchor do you remember that then the can anchor to reality yeah and so and so something objective um um yeah yeah exactly again if i'm wrong about this that um this is actually more on steven let me know that one of the things that you are you want to do and this is why i'm so interested in the, the utility concept you want to root these words in biological reality as opposed to, to borrow a term, utility. Is that accurate? I, I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I think biology should be what they're based on, but again, there can be some blur around the around the, the edges. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, there, there can, there's going to be exceptions in, in so many cases. So when you look at these terms, you're, the paradigm under which you're operating is you've used the word a few times, re like biological reality, it's, it's something that would, would enable an independent adjudicator to come in, like someone from Korea, someone from, you know, Swahili, what, you know, whatever, it was some piece of Swahili, wh wh wherever. Is, is that the impetus behind this? Or, or have I got that wrong? Yeah, something that's independently verifiable. And then in, in, in terms of like law and stuff, you know, I, d I just don't know the utility of, organizing society around like the extremely rare exceptions as opposed to like the down the fairway this is what is almost always the case um starting from there and then counting for exceptions rather than trying to like count for exceptions first to blow up the entire uh, system that we have okay so this is my question for you then Stephen. so she she and, and call it if i've miss if i've if i don't have this right please please correct me so you're you're attempting to anchor this in biology, and are you attempting to anchor these definitions in utility? Uh, so I feel like we've covered this with 
when we went over my stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry if I failed to communicate. No, no, no. I just want to make sure I understand. No, so like when it comes to sex, if you want to anchor that in something concrete, yeah, I, I, can, I can understand that. Like, okay. th this is not where I'm having any grievances, really. Okay. My grievances is when you make a necessary condition of gender, female, adult, etc., because they have these these rare exceptions. The point isn't... Like, no, if you listen to trans people, and you listen to people, when it, even intersex people, they're not telling you burn the whole thing down because I'm an exception. They're saying, just make some fucking room. Like, like we found... A platypus, right? What do we do? Do we go, we're not going to go woke and change our definition of mammal. We said, no, okay, typically mammals give birth to live young. So when you say make some, make some room, you mean make some linguistic room, like extend the semantic range of the term. Well, this is one of the reasons I do not like the definition, or I, I should say, I see utility in his, in the definition that, that um, Colin's putting across, an adult human male being a man. But... I see greater utility in my view, and what I'm trying to do here is break down, just as Colin broke down some of his concerns with my views and I offered rejoinders, I'm trying to break down what I have issues with his uh, definition. Okay. Hoping to get his responses on, on well, those. Okay, so Colin, how important is utility in these definitions for you? I think utility is a, a big part of it, and I think the most utility is we can wring out of it is by rooting it in biological reality. Okay, I'd like to talk about that, Clay, because that seems Are we to not be... going to go with his... Well, we, we can do that, but I just like would like to... Because I think that's a point of contention. Can I respond to one thing, too? Because you said that intersex people aren't like saying to burn down the whole system, but they're often used to do just that, to say that sex is a spectrum because some people are don't fit into these binary categories so easily or there's some blur therefore people like leah thomas who have nothing resembling an intersex condition should be able to compete as a biological female in all these cases so like they are being used to blow up the categories completely there are activists and people that are doing this and i'm on your side guys i've been cancelled over this right i gave a view on sports where i said it's about the viralization of testosterone. The women's league may as well be called the cis women's league or the post viralization league or the uh, below five nanomoles per liter testosterone league. I made a video on that. I made some mistakes. So I recreated it where I expressed the same view, but it got me canceled. It got, it got me a lot of hate. I totally hear you, man. Like there are major problems there, but the mistake is to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say all the trans stuff is deranged. Like it's not. And like, and, and viewing sex and gender as, as, as uh, uh, viewing other views, seeing other views with utility, such as what we're breaking down here. Like, it's just, I, I hate to see it because I see people criticizing these people going too far. And I'm like, yeah, you should. But then they just fall into like this anti-woke uh, category where they're not like seeing, like one of the reasons I emphasized earlier on, and I really wanted to nail down that this rational disagreement is because that normally doesn't happen. Now I'm getting cancelled from the other side that are going, Stevens went woke. He doesn't accept biological reality. I, I just, I, I, I don't like the way that it's approached because your approach seems to be in like, we have this system that works in almost every instance and you approach it and you're saying like, well, what about this case? If this per didn't reach maturity, there will remain neotenous forever. And to me, that just says like, blow up the whole, the whole system is completely BS and we need to throw out the whole thing. But it accounts for almost all of what we want in almost every single context. And so we need to start with the down the fairway, what gets us almost all the way there. And then we can make small you know, changes for rare, rare exceptions. That seems the rational way to go forward with it. So what, what, what I'm trying to achieve here is, is to point out that the overconfidence that you see in people going, adult human male, that's it, done. It's reality. All I'm doing here is pulling and pushing it apart so that I can try and el elicit from people just the smallest amount of humility. Now, you're not like necessarily someone that's that's being definitive on this, but I'm sure you've seen from one of us from the other side of the park that they are doing this. So the exceptions here is trying to break that that uh, emphasis on having the right view. And then, if if I may, the, the other issue we have is that if we do make adulthood based on uh, sexual maturity. And we've got a situation where you could argue that Muhammad was right to, you know, be able to have sex with Aisha when she was nine, because that's when, you know, that's when it happened. 
But then you referenced that we actually have a cultural construct of age. We just say it's after you've been on the earth for 18 years, 18 times it's went around the world, which means that you're using the social construct to get the leverage and the utility for society, not the fact that we're an adult. But it's, those laws are rooted around some biological realities, though. And it's, like, it's not like it's totally arbitrary. I mean, we say that we, we make a, a age cutoff because in the vast majority of instances, people mature and they grow up and, you know, everything is functionally going according to plan. Um, and this, this is why we have laws that reflect that. And then as a society, we've said that we want to actually legally increase the age because there are certain aspects where people are actually quite vulnerable below a certain age. But, I mean, it's the, the impetus for the laws is rooted in the fact that the overwhelmingly vast majority of people just develop completely normal. And so that's what we should be starting from. So if you're going with drawing the line at 18, which is a social construct, uh, because it has some of the qualities we're looking for in order to essentially arbitrarily say that that's adulthood, because obviously your brain doesn't stop till 25. This is one of the reasons that the Romans wanted to put it at 25, for instance. Um it seems to me what you have is your view is predicated on a social construct, adulthood. What this means is that your view itself is a social construct because one of its pillars is a social construct. There is a sense that adulthood can be a social construct when we're talking about whether or not we want to make it legally, uh, you know, change the adult age. But there is something what it means to be an adult biologically that is a real thing. And so our laws should be, you know, based on biology as much as possible until it really doesn't make sense as a society, you know, and then we can talk about where and when those don't make sense and what should be the best. This is where I see, for instance, the issue. Like, so if we go back to when Christianity was having its heyday, uh, they would go, yeah, my adulthood is when you can reproduce. Now, now you can sell your daughter. Like, now we can start making uh, our, we can move forward of society. But as we've moved on, as we've done all of the things that you mentioned earlier with with progression you know we fought against this and for these reasons we've raised the age to 18 and so because we're using a cultural construct referring to when there's a biological element of when we hit adulthood which could be 12 or 10 or something like that that's not doing the work at all so the fact that adulthood you, when you say adult human male the word adult and its references to biology isn't doing the heavy lifting. What's actually doing, or at least the uh, when we hit reproductive age, the heavy lifting is just the cultural construct. We've made it up, right? That's So you say that there's a component. I would argue that it's the largest component. And because it's such a large component to it, it it's going to have effects on your definition of what a man is and that is exactly what we see in society i think society is designed around that social construct and that's why for instance social construct view makes better sense of the data whereas if you have a better sense than what better better sense of the data than basing it in realism like a realist view like we don't we don't organize our society right based around um when we hit reproductive age but it's, i mean but the laws are starting based on the fact that organisms do age over time and they reach a certain they tend you know in the normal progression of things uh become more mature become more able to make decisions their their minds are you know less uh, fueled by emotion and they can have a more rational thinking mind um but yeah we do depart from strict biological reality when we decide to you know raise that age and just call it 18 but it's not like completely arbitrary is what i'm trying to say is that it's it's based on some concept of maturity that goes beyond, uh, you know, your, your reproductive capacity or something like that for society. I agree. But one, once you say that it's that there is this arbitrary factor to it, that we're talking about utility. Well, if you're asking me as a biologist what a woman is, I would probably use the biological definition. I would say that, you know, if you have reached sexual maturity, you are a woman in a very strict biological sense. And then you can say, well, should this be the same case? Should they, should they be legally considered a woman? And then there can be debates about well, what is that necessary? Which I would not, I think the, I think 18 is probably a, a decent age for adulthood. 16 is a good age for driving, that type of stuff. Yeah, so by my lights, actually, you're telling me one definition and emphasizing the realist factor of when you've hit reproductive age, but it's not the thing that's giving you the utility. 
the utility in your view is the social construct thing that we've decided it's 18 because it correlates with other factors such as brain development and things like that and it's roughly the case that's why we've decided it's going to be after 80 rotations on the earth but if that's the case your view is also a social construct just like mine mm, i wouldn't say because when i hear social construct i hear like this arbitrary complete arbitrariness and it's not it's not completely arbitrary neither is what a castle is it's not arbitrary it's trying to uh, make sense of data it's informed by biology to some degree though but it does depart from that just as you know should a woman with cais you know who has testes whose biological male be in a, a restroom like our laws can depart from reality slightly uh they, they can still be a legal fiction it doesn't mean that there's not some sort of root reality that they're sort of based on yeah so is there like a root reality of what it's loosely based on to be an adult of course uh what about uh sex yeah yeah so i i realize and i place this fault on myself i realize that i've made a mistake in the conversation because people are going to be watching this and they're going to be saying well what are these guys talking about when they talk about a social construct so could you please uh define what you mean by a social construct so in a social construct i think the best way to get the concept to someone is through an example okay and that is that we have a word to say for castles and when i mention a castle you have an approximation in your mind of what i'm talking about and so we have this concept of what it is and then we're trying to provide definitions and uh, uh words to convey that so you have like a that's what a social construct is i mean I, i'll give you another example so there's one on the table money right so if you got out a hundred dollars out of your pocket and i said listen i'll give you a quid do you want to trade because I've got a coin, you've got paper. You're not going to do it because we've decided as a society that your money, the $100, is worth more. Okay. So now graft that on to the conversation. Like one of the things that I hear you saying a lot of is you're talking about social constructs. What is the relationship between, and if this is an unfair question, that, to let me know. What is the relationship between social constructs and biology you've used the word realism the word realism has come up but just biology broadly construed like if it's an unfair question what, 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 what are you meaning by, by biology yeah so i've got a you you're talking like women adults well then what's what i'm thinking of but i'm I'm thinking if we can give another example then because we get there's so much valence to it emotional stuff that when, when people say that something is a construct and you you gave the word uh, um like an adult being a construct. So the person lives on a planet, the planet makes so many rotations around the sun. Mm -hmm. Those are descriptions that are factual. And then we pull from that and we construct a legal infrastructure around that. Yeah, likewise, your money is yeah. made of some things. There's a biologic, there, there's the, bio, the biology would correlate with the fact that there's a tangible product for money. Right. So that's real. I'm not questioning whether or not money is made of coins and paper, but then it comes to what is the value of money? What is a hundred dollars? Because it isn't the paper on its own. And if you only had the paper and you were on your own, it doesn't mean anything. Whereas if you agreed with me and you agreed with Colin that it's worth a hundred dollars, then that's when it's got social utility and right. it's a social construct. Okay. So I'm trying to use me then think what is the what is the departure? What's the difference that you two have with regard to the role that social construct plays either in reality or linguistically? Do you want to take this one, Colin? Or? Yeah, it's a, you know, I got about a five-minute hard out. Um, so what was it? Can you rephrase the question one more time? Uh, is the role... And then I want to ask some five-minute hard out. So real quick, and I'm not going to give you a chance to respond to this because I want to do, wrap it up. Uh, what, what is the, it, it, okay, it's, I'll put it on myself. It seems to me that Stephen's argument rests more heavily on social constructs than yours do. Is that accurate? I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right, I want to, I want to pause cause we've done, I, I want to say like, I've never seen anything this detailed ever. Like I've never seen anybody do this to, to this degree. Okay. So, and it's okay to say, to say no to this, but. Ha has this process of going through these words clarified 
any disagreements that you may have had, like, is it more clear what the disagreements are about now? I'll give it to you first. Yeah, no, any time we do the process of what we're doing here, which I take to be philosophy, this is, this is, I mean, as a philosopher, would you say that this is philosophy? Not like, really. premises? It's, well, it's kind of argument mapping, but, yeah. But anyway, but has this helped? Yeah, of course. Okay. Because what it allows us to do is to understand which of my objections that Colin sees as having merit, which of them he doesn't, is allowing okay. to see what his views are of mine and his objections and his criticisms, and it's allowed me to understand whether or not I think they map on or not. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful process. People should be doing this more often with conversations they disagree with. I completely Absolutely. agree. What I, what I didn't do is ask what it would take to change your mind about certain things. That would be like our three. But um, the process that we've gone through here, um, so, so, so it's been clarifying and the disagreements have been clarifying, Have has either one of you changed your mind about anything, about the definitions, about, I don't know, anything, utility, truth, has any any change of mind, or has it just increased an, an understanding of the other person's position? Colin, I'll let you take that one. I would say I understand Stephen's view more, especially where it departs from like WPATH and sort of a lot of the scientific and medical organizations. Um, I can't say that my view has changed, though, but I understand what he, I think I understand well uh, what Stephen believes. Okay, that's the philosopher Habermas is the theory of communicative action. He says that communication should always, you know, basically seek to understand the seven habits of highly effective people, too. So do you understand more now Colin's point of view or no? Like if, if there have been things that have been clarified? Yeah, of course. Okay, so there are still disagreements. Yes, mm -hmm. and I know you have a hard out trying to be very respectful of that. So if we were to do that, if we were to do another one of these, maybe online or what have you, I don't know, I would like to take those disagreements and write them down in sentence format and apply a similar process to those disagreements to figure out, now that we understand what the disagreement, disagreements are, how to, to, where to go from there. That's what I would like to do. Yeah, we can have further discussions on, on this, of course, yeah. I'd like to make it out to the UK at some point in the near future. And if I do, we can even do it over Zoom. But I, I would love to do it in person because it's just so much better than than Zoom, even casually over a beer or something, too. You know, I would love it. Um, well, cool. Well, Colin, I really want to uh, thank you for coming in and talking to us. I know you have a heart out. Stephen, I want to thank you and coming to London here to talk to us. And uh, uh, Reed is, of course, here and, and, and Travis and Reese. I don't know what you've done, but thanks. Anyways, <laughs> three <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for the conversation, guys. We we appreciate it, and maybe we'll we'll have a, a round three where we do uh, uh, get in some sub final words. You guys cool? Uh, do you have final words or not that I can sum up in a minute? <laughs> I, I enjoyed the I really enjoyed the conversation. I still think that there's a regressive nature that is not hitting home for some reason, but maybe in another conversation. I can convince you of that, maybe. All right, um, and I would look forward to another conversation. I guess I'll, I'll end with this, and that's just saying. I really appreciate your time uh, sitting down, having this conversation. I think it's wonderful. I really do hope that the main takeaway from this conversation for people is that there is room for rational disagreement because we are not going to move forward if people keep running around saying that there is only one way to look at this and everyone else is deranged. That's not good enough. That's not how that works. I, I'll give my uh, t t take. Uh, one of my deliverables is it's possible to have a substantive disagreement with somebody and have a civil exchange with them. In fact, we're going to go out to dinner and drinks now. Uh, it, it, it's possible to do that. But we live in a culture in which, you know, it's very easy to do stuff online, to snipe, et cetera. Um, and I think more people should be doing this. And, and I, I do acknowledge that this is kind of a pain in the ass. Like this is actual work and intellectual labor that you have to sit down and do this. But at the end of the day, I think it's super important to, to put that time in and do that work. And if you don't, you're doing the arguments a disservice. So anyway, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. I appreciate it.